Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures on the birth of stars. Up until this point, we saw the evidence for how stars change with time. We did so by examining the Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams of star clusters. We saw that we could discover the distinct age differences between star clusters based on how the stars were arranged on the distance normalized diagrams and compared their spectral types with their absolute magnitudes. The main sequence turnoff point indicates the cluster's age. But from where did this concept of that turnoff point arise? It comes from understanding that stars, by turning gravitational potential energy into emitted light, evolve and change with time. Therefore, they must be born, live a long life, and then die. This process is dependent on only a few things, but principally on the star's mass and composition. Environmental properties such as proximity to other stars, concurrent planetary formation, or if they reside in some big gas cloud, influence their lives only partially. Except the stars are quite near to each other, then big influences are possible. Here we see the quintessential elements of stellar evolution distilled down to its most basic form. Every star starts as a diffuse cloud of gas and dust. The cloud collapses by some process, making dense cores that form warm protostars in dusty cocoons. Low-mass stars are made in huge quantities in these clouds and form clusters of stars. Among the teeming population of low-mass stars, there are higher-mass stars, but they are rare and become rarer with increasing mass. Where a cloud might make thousands of low-mass stars and failed brown dwarf stars, there will be a dozen or so high-mass stars. The brown dwarfs will burn hydrogen for hundreds of billions of years as they cool off to dark cinders. Low-mass stars, from around half the sun's mass up to about 10 or so solar masses, will live increasingly shorter lives the more massive the star. All these will end up as a red giant puffing off their outer layers as planetary nebulae eventually becoming white dwarfs and which will cool off for trillions of years into the deep cosmic future. If the stars are paired up in a binary system, which are actually quite common, and if they orbit each other quite closely, then mass transfer can occur, which can create novae, or even supernovae. Both leave behind either a white dwarf or possibly destroy each other in a type 1a supernova. If the star is more massive than 10 or so solar masses, then ending is a giant supergiant star that explodes in a supernova after only a few million years of hydrogen burning. These flashy, dramatic events are cosmic rarities, as about 90% of all stars that have ever lived or ever will live have masses equal to or less than the Sun. Less than half of 1% of all stars born will even get close to making a core collapse supernova. But these titanic rare events are responsible for creating much of the atomic matter that makes up the Earth and you and me. The remnants of such explosions are either neutron stars or black holes, and these are seen as pulsars or X-ray binaries. Obviously, there's quite a few details I've glossed over, but basically every star is born in a cluster, lives a life on the main sequence, runs out of fuel, and dies. The death of stars change the clouds of gas and dust that will form future stars, adding more heavy elements. We can look at the stages of an individual star's life instead on an HR diagram, and follow its progress as it ages. A given star's spectral type and luminosity change as it ages, so they wander in a very specific way across this diagram. We call these evolution tracks on the HR diagram. On the upper left, we see the effect of stellar cloud collapsing into a protostar, then to the main sequence. On the upper right, we see the exhaustion of the star's hydrogen and transformation into a red giant. Third, on the lower left, we see the death throes of a red giant as it sheds its outer layers to form a planetary nebula. Finally, on the lower right, we see the slow cooling of a white dwarf to a black dwarf. The exact tracks of each star will be different, based on their masses and compositions, which can be changed by close proximity to another star. Therefore, every star follows its own evolutionary track over its lifespan. A cluster HR diagram is the composition of all the stars at different points on their tracks. Massive stars run through their tracks quickly, and low-mass stars run their tracks slowly. It is in this way, knowing the tracks of stars of different masses, that a cluster HR diagram will show its age. 
In many future lectures, we will dive deeply into all these phases, especially for the mass of stars. This journey begins with the study of the birth of stars, from the wispy gossamer interstellar medium to the lumpy, dense molecular clouds, to the glowing cores of H2 regions and protostars that they contain, and stellar birth and their factories that one day might become the most amazing sights in the night sky. Let's go.